Hi, this is Stephanie Su. I'm the assistant professor of Asian art at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Thanks Chris and Inker for inviting me to join the seminar on understanding authenticity in China's cultural heritage. My research field is 20th century East Asian art. As I examine the early text on Chinese art written by Chinese, Japanese, British, and French artists. I noticed that quite a few paintings reproduced in the text are problematic. And that made me think about the relationship between forgeries, misattribution, copies, and art historical writings. My question is, in what way did the, the, um, the copies or forgeries shape canon formation from the late 19th century to the early 20th centuries? In other words, when we talk about canon in art history, we usually think about the authentic original canon. But what if the canon itself is a copy? In today's talk, I'll use some examples from Chinese art historical writings during this period to reflect on this question and complicate the concept of copy. And this is the outline of today's talk. Um, I will begin from talking about the concept of copying in pre-modern China, and then I'll move on to discuss uh, the modern period. And I want to emphasize the modern period is a very important era because the field of art history uh, began during this period. Writings on the history of Chinese art appeared in Europe in the late 19th century and quickly followed by Jap Japanese and Chinese scholarship. And uh, meanwhile, after the collapse of the Qin Dynasty, many Chinese collectors sold their artworks on the international art market, which provided a great opportunity for overseas buyers to collect Chinese art. Among these works, some of them are authentic, some of them are copies, and some of them are forgeries. At any rate, many of the artworks eventually entered important American and European art museums. As I'll demonstrate later, in some cases, copies became the original, which served to satisfy the imagination of Chinese culture or challenge the authority of the original. The early textual record on the importance of copying in painting begins with Xie He's writing. Quote, transmission by copying, that is to say, the copy of models, end quote, Chuan Yi, Mo Xie Shi Ye. In Xie He's opinion, copying the model could ensure that the proper aesthetic tradition would be maintained. The question is, what are the appropriate artistic canons to learn and to transmit? Here I want to review again the concept of canon. The canon in Greek and Latin means measuring rod or standard. And this term can also refer to a model in the sense of guideline, a set of rules or reference points. As art historian Herbert Rocher argues, quote, a canon constitutes a nexus between the identity of the ego and collective identity. It represents the society and the system of values and to which an individual builds his or her identity as a member of the society." End quote. In other words, once the canon is established, an artist has two ways to respond to the canon. They can either perfect the canon or intentionally depart from the canon. But whatever path the artist chooses to do, he or she must first learn to copy the canon. Therefore, um, copying the canon is a very important and fundamental practice in both um, European or Chinese art context. But the concept of canon are slightly different in Europe and China. I'll get to the point soon. Here, um, before we move on that, uh, to that point, I want to emphasize that in these kind of thinking, um, there's a hierarchy between the canon model, original, and copy. Canon is always higher, or the original always higher than the copy. Okay, um, 
in European academic art discourse, copying was very important. Um, here, of course, I simplified a little bit of European academic art discourse, um, but uh, here I just want to get to the main point. Um, so um, in European art discourse, um, it's believed that by imitating classical antiquity and Renaissance art, one was imitating nature perfected. Therefore, artists began copying works by masters as an introduction to the ideal. And by imitation, artists learned to understand the rules of art, including the principles of invention in the great artists of the past. Um, one important difference between European and Chinese concept of copying was that um, in European academic art discourse, copies are supposed to be accurate reproduction of the originals, which is different from the Chinese concept. Here, I want to give you some examples of European art discourse and works. So you can see that here, a Greek sculpture, Lao and his son was copied in the 17th century, exact copy in sculpture. And then you also see example from another artist from 18th century, um, in his drawing, again, copying exactly the same uh, sculpture. And then you have another example um, showing that you know, art is copying just part of the body in order to learn how to express intense, intensive emotions from just part of the muscles. Here are some examples. Um, image on the left is a painting by Rubens. An image on the right is American artist studying in London at that time. In the case of Chinese art context, um, there are three terms related to the imitative practice. Mo, Lin, Fang. Mo can roughly translate it as copying made by tracing. Lin means freehand copying, and Fang refers to imitation. Artists began their studies by selecting the proper aesthetic models for assimilating the styles, typically progressing from copying by tracing to freehand copying and to imitation. But the goal of the various imitative practices was aimed to develop one's own personal style and identity. In a 17th century art discourse, Fang denoted a wide range of meanings, including borrowing, quotation, paraphrase, interpretation, reference, and appropriation. As Catherine Burnett argued, Fang was best translated as to follow after, to be inspired by, or to improvise on. For literati painter Dong Qi Chang, the goal was the goal of Fang was to depart from the original, not to conform to it. In this way, he could achieve an imaginary conversation or spiritual communion with classical masters. The imagery on the right is a work by Zhong Qichang in which he imitated the style of a 14th century master, Ni Zhan. In East Asia, in, um, in, order, um, in addition, to transmitting aesthetic models and developing one's personal style. Art historian Patricia Graham also pointed out other reasons for legitimate copying, including, for instance, the need for a religious object to serve as a stand-in for images too sacred to be displayed publicly, the, or the importance placed on accurate copies of a religious image used to explain complex religious teachings without which particular devotional practices could not be transmitted, or the production of art as a meritorious act of religious devotion, or the fashion for antiquarianism, which popularizes older style, or the perpetuation of a hereditary artistic lineage for which multiplicity of its products and the ability of its members to create works with a recognizable brand, or the necessity of preserving as a pictorial record 
the appearance of a damaged or destroyed original. In Craig Canuna's study on the culture of fakes during the Ming China, he argued that the ability to discern a fake and authentic piece indicate one's taste, status, and social capital. Um, Grunas wrote, quote, if you cannot recognize fakes at a glance, you are not even mediocre, end quote. In other words, the ability to distinguish fake attested to one's social status between those who possess only the wealth necessary to act as consumers of antiquities and those who possess the scholarship and mo morality to truly appreciate antiquities. The situation in the early 20th century, however, was complicated. As Chinese art entered the global art market in the late 19th century, the aesthetic taste became a double-edged sword. Some famous collectors and connoisseurs also developed savvy business skills to profit from the global market demands. For example, uh, Luo Zhenyu was a controversial case. According to art story Hong Zaixin's research, Luo Zhenyu relied on his reputation as a respected connoisseur and sold off a mix of authentic and forged paintings to interested Japanese collectors in order to support his life in Kyoto and research on oracle bones. Therefore, those who possess authentic knowledge complicate the issue of authenticity in the art market. This is a, a comment from the publisher and art collector Deng Shi, which provided a vivid description of how the art market looked like um, in 1911, around 1911. Quote, in the past two or three years, Westerners began to be interested in purchasing old Chinese paintings. After the events of 1900, genuine works of Tang Song and Yuan paintings in the former imperial collection have been transported to all parts of the world. They have found places in the museums of Paris, Berlin, London, and elsewhere for public exhibition. Having been exposed to the old paintings from China, Westerners started collecting them to show off the elegance of their taste. However, they could evaluate what they were collecting only by their resemblance to the dispersed masterpieces from the imperial collection. Because they had little knowledge about connoisseurship, one criteria was to get silk paintings in darkish color, another to choose certain subject matters like figures, birds and flowers and animals, but they ignored the authenticity of the inscriptions and seals. In the past two years, nearly all the old darkish paintings, despite their quality, have been separated out for export from China, a fashion that had brought a huge profit to the antique painting dealers." End quote. And to emphasize in this global um, circulation of artworks, Japan played a specially important role. Um, usually, Painting reproduced in Japanese publications were also reproduced in European and other Chinese books, which created a, a chain of global circulation of knowledge. Um, in this case, as you, as you see in the image, um, the image on the left um, was misattributed to Emperor Song Huizong. And this painting eventually got reproduced in different publications. For instance, Lawrence Beyond's book, Painting in the Far East, published in 1908, described this painting. And Ernest von der Rosa, Epochs of Chinese and Japanese Art, published in 1912, um, also reproduced this painting. And von der Rosa was a curator of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston before he passed away. And this painting was also reproduced um, in Nakamura Husetsu's book, History of Chinese Painting, published in 1913. And this book was translated into Chinese in 1926. And this is another example showing you the important role Japan played. So the image on the right is a copy by a, a Japanese artist in, in the um, thinking um, in imitation. 
uh, Zhao Mengfu. Of course, it's not Zhao Mengfu. Um, and this painting was reproduced um, in Herbert Allen Zhao's book, An Introduction to the History of Chinese Pictorial Art, published in 1905, which was the first book in the English um, language that focused on the history of Chinese painting. And you can see this uh, paragraph was, uh, was possibly written by Lo Binyong because initials. Um, and here you can see Binyong spoke highly of this painting and also Zhao Mengfu's style. Quote, um, his actual brushwork of incomparable delicacy and power is seen in the landscape row, also in the possession of the British Museum, a fragment of which is reproduced in this book, end quote. Lord Binion was a curator at the British Museum at that time. And this is what he wrote in his book. Zhao Mengfu, known to the Japanese as Chou Suigou, was famous for his horses. And um, there are two paintings now in the collection of the French Museum. They're described as copies. No, of such fine workmanship that they might well be thought originals, end quote. In Bion's opinion, if the copies are so good, then they might as well be thought as the originals. So because of this reason, um, there are actually quite a few forgeries and copies uh, or misattributed paintings in the art museums in Europe. Therefore, when Chinese artist Xu Bei Hong organized a Chinese art exhibition in Paris and later on in other cities of Europe in 1933, it noticed quite a few forgeries in the collection of European collectors. Um, this is written by Xu Hong quote, this exhibition included some anonymous works, which are fine works of the Song Dynasty borrowed from Belgian collector, Eldorf Scarlet, but his collection also has quite a few forgeries also borrow about 10 pieces of song mural painting from art dealer City Lu. Um, and nevertheless, Xu Bei Hong's exhibition was very popular in Paris. And besides Xu Bei Hong, another Chinese artist, Liu Hai Su, also organized a few Chinese art exhibitions in Europe in 1934. And those Chinese art exhibitions organized in Europe by Xu Bei Hong Liu Hai Su eventually triggered writer Lu Xun to write an article titled Grabism, not like Zhuyi. So Lu Xun opened his article with this sentence, quote, China was always closed, Bi Guan Zhuyi. Since the cannons and guns opened up the door, not everything was sending off in Song Tu Zhuyi. Recently, a group of antiquities was, was sent to exhibit in Paris, but at the end, we do not know what happened. There are also a few masters who take a few old and new paintings, hanging them in European countries, one after another. They call it as glorifying the nation. I don't want to say more about sending off and otherwise it's too unmodern. I just want to advocate that we should be a little bit more stingy. Besides sending off, we should also grab it, which is what I call us grabism, not actually. We were intimidated by things they were sent to us. The opium from Britain, the gunpowder from the Germany, the perfume from France, and the movies from America. Because these things were sent to us rather than we grab them. So we have to use our brain, I mean, at the target and grab it, end quote. In short, grab is an in Lu Xun's turn referred to the principle of taking whatever is useful. And Lu Xun's concept is close to what Homi Baba describes in his notion of mimicry, quote, mimicry is a one's resemblance and menace, end quote. And this insight helps explain the power of the grabism and Shanghai identity draws from both 
deconstructing and borrowing the legitimacy of the original in mimics. Copy in this context implies subversive ideological positions that change the authority of the original. In conclusion, copy in the 20th century interacted with the process of canon formation and underwent significant changes. First, copy can replace the original and become part of the canons as shown in Zhao's and Bion's books on Chinese art. In this case, the Japanese copy replaced the original Zhao Mengfu's work. And for Bion, if the copy is so good, it can just be the original. And second, copy also gained a new and subversive meaning, that is being pragmatic approach to nationalism, capitalism, anti-imperialism, anti-colonialism, depending on one's own agenda. So this is my talk today. Thank you for listening. If you have any question, please feel free to email me anytime.